it looks like the Windows attack vector is getting a little bit larger thanks to the change that they are doing in the upcoming Home Editions. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, what you can do about it if you need to keep on Windows, and why you might consider making a switch or at least a partial switch to Linux sometime soon. Thanks for checking out this video at Switched to Linux, where we cover things relating to Linux and privacy and some other computer-related topics. If you've not already subscribed to the channel, if you like this type of content, please go ahead and do so. Leave us some comments and some likes, or hey, maybe even some dislikes down there below, whatever you happen to prefer. Well, today we want to talk about the malware called Shrink Locker, which is targeting BitLocker, which is the default encryption protocol used on Windows machines. Now, Shrink Locker is not absolutely new. It's fairly new. But what it does is it takes advantage of the encryption protocols inside of Windows. And prior, it was a issue on corporate enterprise, maybe academic systems, which utilize the BitLocker encryption by default. But of course, if you have followed along the channel for a while, maybe you have or haven't seen it, Windows 11 24H2, the next major release of Windows, which is so major, some people thought this should have been like the Windows 12, uh, but this is still Windows 11 24H2. This will automatically encrypt your home computers as well. Now, I did cover all the details of this in my Doing Encryption the Wrong Way video. If you've not seen that video, you might check that one out as we talk about a couple of the different elements of what this means. Now, first, let's clarify this. If you have a Windows computer, it's a home edition, and it's upgraded into this particular 24H2 edition, it will not encrypt your drive there. But if you need to go through a reboot, like I'm not like rebooting the computer, but if you need to do a, a, a fresh install, or you need to uh, go in and do a system restore point, or anything like that that's beyond just turning on your computer and using it and running the regular upgrades, it's going to encrypt your folders automatically. Now, encryption is a good thing in many cases, and nearly every computer I have in my van is encrypted because if the worst should happen, people won't be able to gain access to any of the information. However, I have intentionally encrypted my drives. I know all of the ways to get into those drives, and that is the unfortunate thing about Windows 11 is that it encrypts drives, and many people do not even know that their drives are encrypted. So you cannot get information without the pass key. And if you don't have that pass key and the worst happens to your computer, you're locked out of your data entirely. Now, they're trying to mitigate this by forcing everybody on a Windows account and they're so storing the encryption pass keys in the account. And that carries with it some other issues that other persons can gain access to your data, but you may not be able to, which is also interesting. But this is happening. Now, where this comes into effect is is Shrink Locker, new ransomware that targets Microsoft BitLocker encryption. And in the early analysis of this, we were only seeing it in the enterprise computers because home editions do not have this enabled by default. Now, it is there. You can use it, uh, but it's not the default. It's not a protocol. So, the problem we have with shrink lockers, we don't know exactly where it's coming from. We don't know exactly who's doing it or exactly how it's being spread. And it does a pretty good job of removing its traces from the computer after it does its dirty deed. Likely, it's going to come through either some known issue or it's probably coming, uh, since it seems to install itself with VB scripts, it's probably coming from email attachments or um phishing schemes that are going to redirect you to a malicious website. Probably that's how it's going to be distributed. That's how a lot of malware is distributed today. But what this does is it gets into your system and then it's going to access your BitLocker, reset all of the keys, and then it's called Shrink Locker because it, it reduces some of your uh, boot partition drive size for some reason. And then it's going to lock you out of your system and remove all of the ways that you usually have to restore your computer. 
Now, you can see here under the Tech Republic article here where it says who is vulnerable, and they say companies in steel and vaccine manufacturing and government entities have thus far been targeted by Shrink Locker. However, there's no evidence to believe they are targeting industries as victims are from different countries and different sectors. So is uh, right now they say the BitLocker is currently only available on the Pro Enterprise and Education and Ultimate Editions, but it will be included and automatically activated on all devices with Windows 11 24H2, which means a much larger attack vector. And that in and of itself is terrifying because the people usually more susceptible to these types of things are your home users. So over here, they talk about what it, what it does. It's going to self-delete itself after encrypting the targets. However, they were uh, Kapersky and an analysts were able to identify it by having a computer that did not have BitLocker configured. So apparently, if BitLocker is on the computer, it still is not enough to, to trigger it. Only if it is configured. It apparently doesn't set up encryption. It will just change encryption. Of course, that might be a limitation that they see, although there may not be a reason to see that change, being as that the next version of Windows is going to have this already configured on everybody's computer anyway, whether you are aware of it or not. Once they have access to the system, they try to, uh, to exfiltrate information and finally execute the ransomware to encrypt the data. So they seem to be stealing some data, but mostly their target is encryption. And they say later on their motivation seems to be more disruption and destruction, not financial gain, as there are, it is very difficult to even figure out who it is that encrypted your system. It's not like it pops up, hey, send us some Bitcoin to get your encryption keys back. No, they're just like, we're just destroying your drive now. Thanks for the information now we're destroying it that seems what it, what it's done so the script uses um the script once it's triggered uses windows management instrument extensions the win32 operating system class to query information about the system and domain if the device runs on xp 2000 2003 or vista then it does not match the target the script simply self-delete so there you go if you want a reason to run xp or vista you're safe from this one. You're not safe from anything else. But well, there you go. All right. If your PC is running Windows 2008 or earlier, it will move to resizing the local fixed drives. It shrinks the non... I'm sorry. I said boot partitions. It says non-boot partitions by 100 megabytes to uh, to create alloc unallocated disk space. That's why it's called Shrink Locker. And the new primary partitions are created in an alloc unallocated space and the boot files are reinstalled. So this is going to be rebooted with the encryption files of the uh, victim. So it rewrites the boot sector to boot this in. It's going to modify the registry to disable remote desktop protocols, enforce BitLocker settings like pin requirements, and then it renames all the boot partitions with the attacker's email, which is either onboarding at proton.me or conspiracyid9 at protonmail.com, and it replaces the BitLocker key protectors to prevent recovery. It creates a new encryption key using the random multiplication and replacement elements, uh, and it just uses um, uh, random numbers, uh, zero to nine, the pantogram, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which contains every alphabet lowercase, and it uses special characters. It enables BitLocker encryption of all device, local device drives. It does not impact anything that is... Um, it doesn't impact anything that is uh, network attached storage, and they believe that that does that to avoid detection. You might trigger something in a network in a monitored system to be able to do that, and then the recovery key they give us gives us no options. We simply boot in, and then over here, the onboard the the drive is re is renamed to their onboarding email address. There's another one here called test. Not sure what that one is. So uh, I will definitely include this link in the description of the video so you can go and read it for yourself. Uh, we don't know the information about it. Now, what can we do about this? Suppose you need to keep on Windows. Well, it just determines, number one, as far as Windows itself going forward, you do need to, every user, if you're using Windows, if you need to keep using Windows, you need to go into your settings, go into your BitLocker settings, and see if your device is encrypted. And then if it is, you need to hit the button to view the 
pass key and you need to save that pass key on something that is not on that computer. This is a great purpose for your little black book of passwords or a external USB drive, anything where that is not stored on the computer itself. You will need that to re-enable it. Or if you have done the risk assessment, you say, I don't need encryption. You can just go ahead and decrypt the drive from there automatically and remove the configuration that appears as though it might make you safe from this particular attack. Now, the other thing you need to do is this stress is the importance for everybody, whether you're a company or an enterprise or just an individual person, you need to take regular backups. Make sure those regular backups are offline and test those backups. You want to do the backups. You want to plug them into maybe a secondary computer if you are able to do that. Verify all of your important data is there. The importance of keeping it offline is so this particular piece of malware does not impact your network attached drive. So in theory, an external drive should be protected. However, I would not trust it and other malware can definitely impact network attached drives. So you want to have, you know, depending on how much data you, you create once a week, once a month, whatever the process is, you want to be able to back up all of your data regularly and then keep that data, keep that the backup of that data on a place offline. And I actually recommend you have at least two copies of that. That's what I do with my my personal files, I have three copies of that uh, data. I have one of it on a computer. I have two external drives. One of those external drives is stored at a friend's house, and one of them is stored with me wherever I happen to be at. Actually, I think I have some in my storage as well. So you want to split those out. If you have a safety deposit box at a bank, that's a great place. Make a monthly trip in to drop your your backup copy of your data there. You just want to make sure that you have different backups in different locations, and you want to make sure that all of these backups are tested properly to make sure everything is working if you need to stay, stay on Windows. Now, in my opinion, uh, moving on to the next part of this video here, we want to start thinking about making a little switch to Linux, if not full-time, at least part-time for your Play devices. So, of course, um, pretty soon here, we are filming a video today. It'll be out probably next week. We'll be looking at five ways to try Linux. So when I, uh, when I release that video, I'll try and go back and link that into here. But we have a lot of prior videos summarizing a lot of those ways to try Linux. I'll go ahead and give you uh, one of those videos here as we wrap up. But... What we want to stress is that Windows is doing things since it's so large, since so many people still use it, and it's enabling things like encryption, which are seem to be targets for malware right now. Uh, it might be worth looking at Linux, at least on a partial basis, to do some of the things that you don't need your Windows for. And for people that need to keep Windows for your work, I perfectly understand that. Maybe you have a piece of software that you absolutely have to run on Windows. Even that, I caution you may not need that piece of software. You need to ask, what does that software do? What is the task I'm accomplishing? And head on over to alternative2.net and see if there's an alternative that is available in the Linux world that you can play around with that. But if suppose you need to keep a Windows computer, that's fine. You can boot your main system into a Linux computer, or you can get a secondary computer, or try Linux through virtualization techniques, things like that. And then what you can do is you can work with that on all of the, the stuff that you want to keep more isolated to yourself, that you don't have all that data going up to some big company to organize and catalog and keep ready for seeing some coming regime change that are interested in the things you like to be interested in. <laughs> okay. That sounds paranoid, but honestly, it's not. It's not. Um, just looking at, at how the political tides seem to swing like a crazy pendulum. Either either the, the good guys are in power or the whack jobs are in power, whichever one you happen to think is the good guys and or the whack jobs, whatever. Linux will keep you more private than that. Okay, I'm going to keep the movies I watch to myself right? Using Linux for that is a great thing because it's going to give you a lot more privacy and still have the options to do your emails and your web browsing and playing many, not all, but many games, doing movies and music, the fun things you do with your computer, you can usually do with Linux just fine. And so definitely consider making that switch over. I'll wrap up this video with uh, a video about some of the basics about slowly switching to Linux, which is my uh, general recommended protocol. 
you just kind of start with looking at what software is available and start playing around with that on your existing computer. So we'll go ahead and leave a video for that. Subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. Check if you are still subscribed. A couple of people have told me that they have been unsubscribed. <laughs> Apparently I've reached that level of YouTube now. And uh, with that, guys, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.